Lighting in Blender is incredibly simple. Hit Shift A, add a light, tweak some settings, then move it around until it looks decent. Congratulations, you've now learned lighting in Blender. Well, okay, there's a little bit more to it. Light is a phenomenon we don't entirely understand, yet this force of nature determines what we perceive and the qualities we ascribe to whatever we're looking at. The exact same object can appear as two different shapes, different colors, different temperatures, or even elicit opposite emotions, depending on the qualities of the lights and shadows around it. The art of lighting is about controlling what we see and what we don't. It's about conveying to others the characteristics that we care about. If you've already modeled an object, the next step is to show it off. Just like a photographer choosing which qualities of a subject to emphasize, your task with lighting is to bring out the best in whatever it is that you've created. I'm Jonathan Lampell with CGCookie.com, and in this course about the fundamentals of digital lighting, we're going to look at how light works, how it's simulated in Blender, and how you can use it to make your projects look amazing. We'll start off in cycles and talk about the main properties of light objects and environment lights and how you can tweak them to get the results that you want. Along the way, you'll learn important concepts about path tracing, which will help you create any lighting effect on your own. From there, we'll switch over to Eevee and demystify what's going on with shadows, environments, and bounce lighting during rasterization so you can get as close to cycles quality as possible but without the extra headache. Lastly, we'll look at how to take your lighting from good to great by talking about best practices and a few tricks that can instantly transform a render from okay but kinda boring to jumping right out of the screen. Whether you're brand new to Blender or a pro that just needs a refresher to up your lighting game, I made this course for you. Here's the first lesson to get you started. While nobody knows exactly how light works, we've learned enough to reasonably approximate it. This course is mostly going to cover the artistic side of lighting and how to use lights in a 3D software but I think it'll be helpful to have a general knowledge of what happens when you click render in order to understand some of the light settings, because lighting and rendering are tied super closely together. Rendering is the conversion of a 3D scene to a 2D image, and somewhere in there we need to define how bright or dark each pixel should be. In other words, one of the main tasks of a render engine is to simulate light. But first things first, what exactly is the phenomenon that we're trying to simulate? Well, here's the basics. When atoms get really excited, their electrons jump down a level and emit photons, which then travel at 300,000 kilometers a second in a straight line until they hit something and bounce off in a different direction or get absorbed. These photon particles have a wavelength that corresponds to how excited those electrons were when it was ejected into space. The largest wavelength we can see appears to us as the color red, and as you decrease the wavelength to the opposite end of the visible spectrum, you progress through the rainbow and eventually get to indigo. Before or after those two colors, our eyes just don't recognize any information. You'll notice that there's no white wavelength here, and that's because it's a combination of all seven main colors of the rainbow. When you have a bunch of atoms that are all excited, but some are randomly more excited than others, you'll end up with the colors appearing to combine like that as the barrage hits our eyeballs. So white is the colors combined, and black is no color at all. But now that you've got the full story, let's look at how we simulate that on a computer while rendering. We'll have a full course on the fundamentals of rendering later on, so for now let's just stick to the basics as it pertains to lighting our scene. There are a lot of different methods of simulating light, and no two programs do it exactly the same, but there are two main approaches. The first is called path tracing. As the name implies, this is where an algorithm traces the path of a simulated photon to find out how it should bounce off or get absorbed by our geometry. There are an essentially infinite number of photons that would never hit our eyes or cameras, so computing every single one that comes out of a light source would be a massive waste, not to mention impossible. So instead, we track the photon backwards, starting from each pixel of the camera, to check if it hits a light or not. Based on that info, we assign values to every point that it bounced along the way. Shooting only one photon per pixel isn't very accurate though, because there's often details that are smaller than just one pixel, and one photon may go in a direction that a second photon wouldn't. So we just shoot a whole bunch of slightly randomized photons and average out the result. By doing this, we can get incredibly realistic images since our simulated light more or less behaves as it should. As you can imagine though, even though we're cutting some corners here, this process can be quite slow. The second and older type of rendering is called rasterization, and it's blazing fast. It's what's happening in your 3D viewport just without all the fancy lights and features. This is an entirely different approach, where the geometry is projected onto the screen from back to front, and each pixel checks what piece of geometry it hits, if any. Shading is calculated by the surface's angle towards and distance from any light sources, and shadows are created by generating an image from the point of view of each light in every direction and checking what geometry is visible from the light. That's why if you're curious, rasterized shadows like in a game engine have a resolution setting. Because there's no light bouncing going on here, there's no mirrors or indirect lighting, 
which is really important in order for a lot of scenes to look believable. Mirrors can kind of be faked though by flipping what's on the screen, but there's big limitations to that. Reflection probes can also give you some decent reflections by essentially taking a render from the point of view of the object, but it only really works for very simple geometry and definitely eats up memory. You can also approximate indirect light by placing a whole bunch of grid points all over the scene. These points, called light probes, capture an image from every direction and use that to determine what color should be projected onto the nearby objects. This process is pretty slow if you have a lot of probes, so you only do it once and not in real time. We call this process baking because it solidifies the result and doesn't change after the fact unless we bake it all over again. That means that only stationary objects will get the right look and any moving objects need to be excluded or they'll totally mess up the result. As you can see, rasterization is a bit more complex to work with than ray tracing. If you want to see the full set of differences from an artist's point of view, check out my EV vs Cycles article that I'll link to below. Suffice it to say though, you're going to get better results out of the box with Cycles because everything just works like it naturally should. With EV, you're going to have to fiddle with more settings and accept that some things just won't look right. In a lot of basic use cases though, it can get surprisingly close in a fraction of the time. For example, this render took 24 seconds in Cycles, and only 1 second in EV. In this course, I'm going to start with Cycles because it's easier, and AI denoising makes it faster than it would be just by itself, but we're going to explore lighting in both render engines because for some projects you want simple and blazing fast, and for others you want total believability and don't really care if it has to render overnight. That choice is totally up to you and depends on the particular project. Of course, you'll never have to worry about the physics of light or anything like that in order to actually use lights in Blender, and I don't expect you to have memorized everything in this video. But I hope that having a general understanding of what's going on behind the scenes will make tweaking settings that would otherwise seem a bit weird make more intuitive sense. In the next video, we'll get you up and running using lights and cycles.